Welcome to uh, Claremont Parish Church and to our recorded service for the Sunday the 20th of June. Uh, I'm John Collard and sharing in the worship today are Morag Drumgold who's doing the Bible reading and the Renew Youth Group who are leading the prayers for others. Alison Ross is doing the BSL interpretation and the folk who are behind the camera that you won't see, but without whom none of this would happen, are Martin Grant and Lewis Hunter. So let's begin our worship with uh, a song that many of you may not know. It's new, I think, to, to some at least. And it's the song, Be Still, My Soul, Be Still, by Keith and Kristen Getty and Stuart Townend. As we gather for worship today, we are different people and we're all in different places. We bring different priorities, different personalities and different prejudices. And yet we are all gathering in order to open ourselves up afresh to the truth of God. So wherever we are, and whatever our circumstances, as we gather, may we know the presence of God and the renewal of heart and mind that that presence of God brings us. May we hear God's call and may the living God grant us time for the renewal of our lives. Let us pray. Faithful God, we experience the generosity of your blessings in so many ways. When we're hungry, you sustain us. When we're broken, you offer us wholeness. When we feel lost, you point the way home. May our experience of your compassion transform us so that we in our turn make known in our acts of compassion your love for the world. Amazing God, we come to you today with many differences, and yet we know that you are constant. By whatever path we have been led to Jesus, 
and for however long we have been on that path. We come because we know you a little and we would like to know you better. You are a God who renews us. You are a God who gives us life afresh. You are a God who shows us new directions. Be with us then as we continue our journey through our worship today. For all that you have given us, we thank you. For all the times that we have not done as you would have wanted, we are sorry. When we feel empty, fill us with life afresh. When we haven't lived as you direct, help us to make straight our paths. When we have not spoken out against injustice or hatred, make us the voice for all who have been silenced. For all our failings and our stumblings, God is faithful and true. God forgives us and offers us renewal, life afresh, and new direction on our journey. Thanks be to God. And let us pray together in the words that Jesus gave us, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time we try and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and power and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> from Exodus chapter 23, verses 1 to 19. Exodus 23, verses 1 to 19. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd, and do not show favouritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. 
If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you falling down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their losses. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds those who see and twists the words of the innocent. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners, because you were foreigners in Egypt. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unploughed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. Three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year all the men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must not be kept until morning. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Amen. The book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Bible, of course, I think of as being divided into two very broad sections. And in my mind, I think of them as plagues on the one hand and pomegranates on the other, which maybe needs a bit of explanation. I suppose plagues is fairly obvious. It's a reference to the ten plagues of Egypt. And in my mind, that's shorthand for the whole of the first section of this book. It's all about Moses, his birth, his upbringing, his early life, his return to Egypt, his confrontation with Pharaoh, and then the culmination of that in the Passover and the escape through the Red Sea. That's the plagues bit. The second section I um, think of in my own little shorthand as pomegranates. Why is that? Because uh, pomegranates, or at least the representation of pomegranates, are used to decorate the hems, the edges, on many of the priestly garments worn by Aaron and his sons. And this second section in the book of Exodus spends a lot of time on very detailed instructions about design and construction and furnishing of the tabernacle. There are precise details about the, the special vestments that Aaron and his sons were to wear when they were discharging their priestly duties, and it includes these pomegranates. I remember years ago actually plowing through these later chapters in Exodus with Selwyn Hughes's Bible reading notes, which some of you may have used, called Every Day with Jesus. And to be honest, I got a bit fed up where chapter after chapter of acacia wood and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and the hems of garments, uh, which were adorned with pomegranates and gold bells. If you have a look at the later chapters in this book, you'll maybe see what I'm talking about. So here are the main sections. There are plagues and pomegranates. And between those two main sections of the book, there is a, a shorter middle section which is concerned with the laws and the regulations of the covenant, and 
this middle section includes one of the, the two lists in the Old Testament of the Ten Commandments. The, the Ten Commandments occur in Exodus 10, 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. So the middle section of this book contains one of those lists of the Ten Commandments. And chapter 23, which is the part of the chapter that Morag read for us, belongs in these middle chapters between the plagues and the pomegranates. Here's the middle chapters, one of which is this chapter 23. And the context of this middle section of the book is really transition. The Hebrew people were in transition. They were making a transition from the chaos and the uncertainty of slavery to a more settled existence, albeit one that was still not established and was moving towards the promised land. That's the context, the transition from plagues to pomegranates. And in any uh, transition, one of the questions is, how shall we now live? The whole idea of transition is one that I find very interesting because it has relevance in many areas of life. William Bridges is an American author whose work in this area is highly respected by many. And what he suggests is that there is a profound difference between change and transition. Change happens very quickly. It happens all the time, it happens quickly. Transition is much slower and often a more painful process. It is the process of um, emotional and psychological adjustment to the change. I suppose a mundane example would be that when uh, Tesco over the road there decide to put their baked beans in a different place, that's the change. The transition is the adjustment that it takes me to feel comfortable and familiar with that new layout of the shop. A more profound example, of course, would be in the, the grief process. Change is the death of a loved one, and that can happen quite quickly. In fact, sometimes it can happen very suddenly. And the transition is the uh, emotional uh, adjustment to that new reality. And, and in the terms of grief, it, or it can take months or even years to accomplish. So here's the Hebrew people in transition. They were slaves. They were oppressed. They were allowed to do only what their masters had commanded. They were not in charge either of their day-to-day -day lives or of their uh, longer-term destiny. And now all that has changed. They're free from Pharaoh. They're no longer at the beck and call of others. And the transition that is marked between the two parts of Exodus is the adjustment to their changed circumstances. And the question that is there is this question, how shall we now live? And as I say, there are elements of this dynamic, this change and tra transition in many parts of our lives. I suppose the particular transition that is making an impact right across the world at the moment is how we deal with life as we emerge from lockdown. Things have changed over the last period of time, and, and in some ways they changed quite quickly and quite dramatically. And how do we make the transition from, from the lockdown to a more um, free uh, circumstance again? And it's not really clear, is it, at the moment, what has changed permanently and what might simply revert to previous practice. In other words, for us, this is a time of transition. It's a time of adjustment. And that same question hangs around for us, I think. 
how shall we now live? And perhaps this passage can help us because it has something to say about the way that the Hebrew people worked out how to live with that new reality. How shall we now live? First of all, live, the passage says, live honestly. Do not spread false reports, verse 1. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong, verse 2. Do not accept bribes, verse 8. Do not show favoritism or oppress an alien, verse 9. Whereas in Egypt, as slaves, the Hebrews simply had to do what they were told. Now it's up to them to set their standards. And one of the most basic requirements of God's law is to live honestly. What does that mean, to live honestly? Well, I think it goes well beyond, although it includes, not telling of lies. To live honestly is to resist the pressures, the pressures of popularity, the pressures of money, the pressures of crowd think, even the pressure of looking after only ourselves. How might the requirements of living honestly have affected what happened in George Square the night that Rangers won the league? I wonder. How might the requirements of living honestly affect the UK's government's policy on vaccine sharing or on cutting overseas aid? And at a more personal level, how does emotional honesty impact my daily living? Perhaps it means not trying to pretend I am something I'm not, not painting a picture for others that's not true to what's inside me. And perhaps it means giving that same space to other people, not requiring them to fit into our parameters, but having grace enough to allow them to be who they are, living honestly. And then there's living joyfully and rhythmically. The Hebrew people faced with this transition established through these chapters a pattern of festivals, three festivals every year. And the key verb in relation to festivals is celebrate, enjoy. That's what festival's all about. And there's a strong element of truth, isn't there, in the idea that the Jewish identity is expressed in food and festivals. I remember many years ago visiting a, a Jewish family in London. They must have been part of a trip that was arranged through New College, I think, and uh, stayed with them for the weekend. And I was really struck by the way that food played a very important and central role in the expression of their faith. But the joy and the rhythm is not limited to those three annual festivals, there is both a longer rhythm and a shorter rhythm. The longer rhythm is the rhythm of seven years. Every seventh year was to be a fallow year. And it's extraordinary how modern, in some ways, that sounds in light of uh, environmental issues. And the shorter rhythm is of seven days, six days for work, followed by a day for rest. Human beings thrive on rhythm, a pattern of work and rest, of ordinary and a festival. So how shall we now live? Honestly, joyfully and rhythmically. And then this, communally, communally, <laughs> and generously. Gordon touched on this, I think, a couple of weeks ago when he talked about the, the question of the purpose of meeting together in church as the lockdown restrictions are eased. One of the phrases in this Exodus passage which really strikes me is in verse 17 where it says, 
three times a year, all the men, all the men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord. And if we can just for a moment set to one side the discussion of gender equality in that uh, phrase and focus on the all, what we see is that worship festivals, celebration, were to be for absolutely everybody, the whole community. Does that mean that everyone in that community got on well together? That they were all friends with each other? They all liked each other? Well, I can categorically tell you that the answer to that question is no. They didn't all get on, they weren't all friends. How do I know that? Because the passage says that some of them were enemies. Verses 4 and 5, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you, fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help him with it. And this isn't addressed to um, um, outsiders. This is talking to the Hebrew people themselves, the community of Israel. The community of this people was a community not so very different from ours. Some of them got on with each other, some of them didn't. Some of them were friends, some of them were enemies. But despite that, they were all, all, to be part of the joyful, regular, generous community of worship. And I wonder why. Why is that communal aspect so important? Why should we not continue to watch church on YouTube in our pajamas? even when the restrictions are lifted? And perhaps the answer is because community at worship, joyful, generous, is actually a visual aid for what God is doing with people. He is creating a new community. How shall we now live. In this time of transition, honestly, joyfully and rhythmically, communally and generously. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word which addresses us very directly. And as we look at the challenges for these Hebrew people who'd become slaves and then moved to a different kind of way of living. We thank you for the um, way in which they were guided by your word to answer that question, how shall we now live? And we pray that you'd help us to be guided by your word so that we might live to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the, uh, the joys for me of lockdown has been the way that our praise band has been able to produce such high-quality music videos for us to enjoy. And this next song is the song, Come, People of the Risen King. And after this, we'll confess our faith together by saying the words of the Apostles' Creed, which will be on the screen for you.
I believe in God. God, we want to bring all these people and pray that they would be able to find joy in loving you. We pray for the people in Yemen who are currently going hungry from famine. We pray that you would be able to be made known in the suffering and that they would find relief and aid from other countries and organisations. We also pray that countries would support those in suffering in Yemen and provide food to those who have none. We pray for the current climate crisis and specifically the rampant deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. We ask that those who are responsible for this would reduce their destruction of the forests and that the species in the forests would still have an ecosystem to call their home. We also ask that the Brazilian government step in to the situation and implement more restrictions on deforestation. We pray for Dundee where cases are starting to rise and ask that people would be kept safe and that restrictions and safety guidance would be followed. Cool. We also pray for those caught in the fire at Loch Tay and that they would be able to be kept safe. We also pray that they would be able to develop quickly. We pray for all the parents who have day jobs and rely on the school for all their childcare needs that they would have the support they need over the summer. We pray for the government that they would provide free school meals for those who would need them. We also pray for all the young people across Scotland who have had a chaotic year with so many unknowns, that they would find this summer a time of joy and relaxation. We pray for the students that may still have exams and assessments and are still waiting for the results, that they wouldn't find themselves overwhelmed with stress and that as they wait for results, they can still find comfort and relaxation over summer. Finally, we pray for those who are starting to go back to church in person and we thank you that we can start to move away from Zoom and see each other face to face. We pray that these times would be enjoyable and that we can find fellowship with each other and worship you. We pray that you would be in all these situations. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.